uh, exit polls in Republican districts where apparently they felt safer to steal the votes. So that, that's two examples of the kind of statistics. Well, the point, let, let, let me oh, just quickly, you know, exit, the reason we have exit polls is precisely to provide this kind of control, right? You have exit polls. So a, a, a flashlight shined on the dark neck of the woods that asks how the votes are actually being counted. And um, this is insane. This is outright irrational and insane. Because when you're trusting a counting system that is concealed, and that's what this vote counting is, it's concealed, it's run by programs. You have no idea whether those programs have predetermined the results, adding votes, subtracting votes, shifting votes. No idea. Who would know? It's no different from handing your vote to a little man, magician's outfit, goes behind the curtain, comes out, tells you who won, tells you that he's already shredded the ballots. Now, would you accept an election result told to you by the man who went behind the curtain? And would you accept it if the man were wearing, oh, I don't know, a, you know, Romney for president, Walker for governor, peace button, some partisan insignia that said, I have a stake in the outcome. And that's what we've got. We've got companies that produce these machines, that service these machines, that deploy these machines, that program these machines, that all, all of them, have a direct line to not just Republicans, but radical right-wingers run these companies. Interestingly named, for instance, Dominion voting. Dominion. I mean, dominionism is, is an interesting, you know, uh, sort of political philosophy. You've got dominion voting, you've got Skytel, you've got what, what Diebold once was, it became premier, and then it got s sort of split off to dominion and ESNS. These companies came into being around the time that voting was becoming computerized. And the people who went into them were radical right-wingers, the Urosevich brothers went into this. They could have gone into soda machines, slot machines, ATMs, a lot of things and made a lot more money. They went into voting machines and took over the voting apparatus for this entire country. Chuck Herron put it best. He's an IT professional. He was a Republican. And he said one very simple sentence because people were always asking, well, yeah, weren't elections always, you know, a little corrupt and Tammany Hall and Chicago and Cook County and 1960, President Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson in Texas, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Chuck Heron said, and I, I can't do the southern accent, but he said, it takes a long time to change 10,000 votes by hand. It takes three seconds to do it on a computer. And the only quibble I would have is that it takes less than three seconds and you can change a lot more than 10,000 votes. And the only limit is will it pass the smell test? Will it pass the smell test? There's no technological limit to how many votes you can steal. And if you want to know one mechanism for doing it, you know the op scans, I'm not sure in New York City what you're voting on, but in Massachusetts, where I come from, we vote on optical scanners. Well, hooray, you have a ballot. You fill out the ballot by hand, and then you surrender it to the op scan machine, and it disappears, and presumably it's counted, right? So what's doing the counting in that op scan machine? It's a memory card. Memory card with about five to 700,000 lines of code on it, okay? If you preset the zero counters on the memory card to plus 50 and minus 50, easy enough to do when it Leaves. I mean, we're, we program everything from computers, you know, the laptops that people have, cars that people have. I mean, this is routine, right? So if as part of the program you insert five lines of code among the 600,000 lines that presets the zero counters to 50 and minus 50 for the candidate you support and the candidate you want to see defeated. At the end of the day, the election administrator running that election sees a clean election. Got the right number of votes, people signed in the poll tape, and you've just shifted 100 votes on that machine. You put that tainted memory card into a couple hundred machines, you just switched 20,000 votes. You want to shift more votes, you set it to plus 100, minus 100. It's that easy. 
Now, don't be glum, it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. This year, our crack investigators have found that the infrastructure that has been installed in a majority of the swing states for the presidential race is not tainted memory cards, it's what happened in 2004 in Ohio. Smart tech lives again without Mike Connell. And it has set up in association with Dominion and various other command central is another wonderfully named vote counting apparatus. It is set up off-site servers to process the vote in these swing states. Off-site, out-of-state, take the vote in, change it in real time so you know how many votes you need to change. If you have to rely on preset memory cards, things could happen like in 2006 and 2008 where last minute 11th hour political developments changed the complexion of the race. Remember in 2006 it was Foley, the Foley scandal. 2008 it was Lehman Brothers collapse. And all of a sudden a close race became a blowout and the rig wasn't enough. There was still evidence of the rig. We kept picking up red shift. It just wasn't enough to win seats, enough seats, or win the presidency. So now you have something you can do in real time. If you need more votes, you just take more votes. And you send it back into the machines from which it came. So there's no evidence in these network machines that anything's happened. You just change the votes and send the totals back in. Cheery. The money, Citizens United, the voter ID laws, serve as means of shifting the political dynamic. Money up to a certain point will buy votes. But what they also serve as, and where the Brennan Center is complicit without realizing it, in saying, oh, five million people are going to be disenfranchised, et cetera, et cetera, is they serve as cover. The day after this election, assuming the results are shocking or surprising, or don't fit the expectations, the polls. What's the media going to say? Oh, Citizens United, it was the money. Just like with Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Well, he got out, you know, his opponent got out, spent eight to one. No wonder why Scott Walker won that election. When, it was, when the exit polls had it dead even. And ten minutes later, Walker's an easy winner by 7%. So, You'll hear, you'll hear about the money. You'll hear about, yeah, well, all that disenfranchisement, you know, all those voter ID laws, well, they were really bad, but they're legal. That's what did it. You'll even hear that the Republicans did some dirty tricks. They made robocalls that said, vote Wednesday, to the unsuspecting supporters of their opponents. They've done this, by the way, several elections now. Now, do you really think there's a bright ethical line between bastards who would write Vote Wednesday flyers and make Vote Wednesday robocalls and send that out, and people who would just change a memory card? Much more efficient, much more covert, much more difficult to detect. This is what they're doing. And I would say, Election Defense Alliance, we're nonpartisan. We want to see observable, transparent, honest elections, hand-counted paper ballots. We want to see votes actually counted in a way that can be observed. But damn it, there's nothing nonpartisan about the patterns that we have detected and analyzed for the last 10 years since the computers came in with the Help America Vote Act. It's not our fault. It's damn partisan. And we have a pretty good idea, you know, where it's coming from. And if you look at why we have this weird politics, and you're wondering, well, does every Republican out there know that these races are rigged? Is that why they're going out there and betting the farm? Is that why they're going out there and taking all these really radical positions? Because it must have been, you know, a bit of a head-scratcher. 
I mean, Bill Clinton won by triangulating. The conventional wisdom is always you got to go for the center in America. You only got so much of a base, and the crucial swing voters are in the center. And you're going for those voters by, I don't know, being a birther, by, by being radical about every single issue. It doesn't make sense, right? It's a, it's, not, it's a nonsensical politics. And yet they win. So you wonder what the nexus is, and the behaviorists would supply a very simple cause and effect. Elections serve as the reward and punishment in this equation. The reward and punishment for behavior. So when you take positions like Scott Walker and you try to destroy unions, or you take positions like Mitch McConnell, or you take positions that, that, are, that are clearly way off the spectrum, that are, that are supporting the interests of the 1%, that aren't even making a logical case, and you then win, as in 2010, swept control of the House, with a very modest national popular vote margin in 2010, but kept squeaking out all these elections, the biggest transfer of seats in history, 128 seat net gain. You would think, I don't know, that o Obama uh, had, I don't, I don't know, that he'd been caught with a page in the bathroom, or God knows, or that he produced a Kenyan birth certificate. So when that happens in 2010, then what effect does it have on anybody who wonders what position they should take? Well, let's go for it. Let's take that far-right radical position. And as long as they keep winning courtesy of election rigging, that's the politics we're going to have in this country. And let me say, I mean, talking about the presidential race um, on the billing for this uh, evening, was intended to sell tickets, and um, I don't know, you know, we, we actually had uh, probably three times as many people here in 2008, in May of 2008, before the, you know, way before the election. So I'm, I'm kind of concerned. It's a rainy night, I know, but uh, thanks for being here, but there are not enough of you. Um, but talking about the presidential race is supposed to be it's sort of a, 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 an appeal, but there is a lot more that goes into a long-term plan for political dominance or perpetual rule, as Karl Rove has stated it, than the presidency. It's quite conceivable that Obama will win this election. It's quite conceivable that the, the long-term plan doesn't really necessarily call for ousting Obama. But it sure as hell calls for controlling the other branches of government and taking all the marbles in due time should be 2014, 2016. So, you know, if Obama wins, uh, if the political dynamics remain roughly the same and he wins, but you see a Senate that goes Republican, a House in which the Democrats make no gains, that is an enormous red flag for the kind of manipulation that's going on. Um, one of the key, key, um, Results of 2010, apart from the House, which of course has given us complete paralysis because they've been completely intransigent, refusing to make any sort of compromise, um, was the state houses. Where do you think all these voter ID law came from? They came from state houses that went Republican in 2010. And, um, I, you know, I can just say that, that it's later than we think. It's close to the point where if you ask what to do, I'd say, I don't know, because there, there may not be a political solution to getting honest elections, to getting hand-counted paper ballots, even to getting robust audits in place. Because once the party or the power that's benefiting from election rigging is fully established <laughs> in power, your political opportunities, your political solutions um, vanish. And then what's left after a political solution is and non-political solution, otherwise known as revolution. Uh, boycotting elections, general strikes, massing in the streets. Not something I want to see. And it's something also that's very hard to imagine in this country, which has for so long assumed that democracy is easy. You just have to go and vote, and it's all taken care of for you. 
And democracy is hard. History has shown that democracy is hard, whether it's Athens or Rome or any other place, America, it's hard. And one of the duties that is incumbent upon us is to run our democracy by fundamentally, first and foremost, being available to count our votes, to actually have manpower, person power, human power, to be counters, be observers, be tallyers, be reconcilers, to make this system work. If we want the convenience of turning it over to computers and saying, yeah, take care of it, then who are we turning it over to? We're turning it over to the individuals who got the jump and got in to the profession and got into that industry and we're turning it over to Karl Rove and anybody else with a conscienceless sociopathic bent who basically wants to cheat, maybe not even out of political conviction, maybe just to play God and see history being made by your invisible hand. We don't know. But if we're not there to do the job, that's who we're forfeiting it to. And that's what we've got right now. And it's pretty dangerous. Okay, thanks. Okay. This is a, a point of information. Three other democratic countries, or one might say three democratic countries, uh, got, got rid of their computerized voting systems. This is Germany, the Netherlands, and Ireland. I mean, they, they saw the same kinds of glitches and malfunctions that we keep seeing, but they had a, a, an adult response, a rational response, which was to say, gee, maybe we shouldn't be entrusting our democracies to these systems. And indeed, in Germany, the high court actually ruled that uh, computerized voting is unconstitutional on human rights grounds, because the results of elections determine, you know, indirectly war policy and things like that. So how can, you, how can you possibly tolerate a voting system that is so easily manipulated? We're not even, we're not within light years of that position because the subject is off limits, it's taboo. The New York Times devotes infinitely more space to reviewing video games than it does to, to talking about this issue. How many articles have they run over the last 10 years? Maybe three, four on, the, on, on this issue? Well, yeah, more than half of them helpfully point out that we're a bunch of lunatics. Yeah, that's, that's the gist of the articles, is generally um, these people are, I mean, this is what came out in 2004 or 2005 after the election. You know, isn't it funny, ha, ha that there are these people out there who can be so deluded? Yeah, tinfoil hat wearing. Conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theorists. Okay, yeah. I, guess, I don't understand though why you think that the Democrats and people like Kerry, you know, who obviously have a lot of clout, why do they just sit back and, and not demand more attention? I mean, you must have a theory about that. It's why. not the question of the other. That's, that's a big mystery. Isn't it? Well, I, I mean, don't you think that the word we can't speak here is oligarchy? And that the Democrats are just as much part and parcel of that situation? That when they had in 2008, when they and Congress and the presidency, what does Obama do? He puts in Geithner, Sumner, another crowd from Wall Street comes in. So the Democratic Party are in no position to question oligarchy because they support it. Well, yeah, that could definitely be. I mean, it's kind of an abstract point, but it, it's as plausible as any other explanation. They're owned by the 1%. I mean, well, they, 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 you know, when he said we should, democracy is hard, yeah, we should try it. Right. Let me, let me, let me uh, add to Dick's story. I had the same experience with John Kerry. Uh, I, I, I ran into him at a fundraiser in 2005 with my book in my hot little hands. It was like, you know, the rest of us, I thought, well, you know, geez, I mean, this is going to change everything. I've got all the evidence in this book. And I handed it to him, and I said, yeah, you were robbed. And he said, I know! That was his response. I know! Leave me alone. Complaining. No, he didn't say leave me alone. He was all excited, and I, I'm going to read your book and everything. So that was on Democracy, one second, I was on Democracy Now! when the book came out, and uh, Mark Hertzgard, another progressive who, you know, there are dozens of progressives who laugh off the argument we're making here. In fact, the left press has been more derisive and hostile than the mainstream press, which mostly just ignores the discussion. 
the left press laughs it off. And he'd written a piece for Mother Jones saying, yeah, it was, there's no evidence that the uh, race in Ohio was stolen. It's based on no research, you know, nothing. I mentioned in the course of this thing, well, you know, Kerry actually thinks the race was stolen. He just told me so the other, the other night. Producers of the show are very excited. They sent out a press release. And within four hours, Kerry's office had issued a statement denying that he had ever said this to me. He said, I gave him the book. It's true, but we didn't have a conversation. Like I was a process server, you know? I went up and I pressed it against him and ran away. Yeah. Same, same thing. My, my theory on it would be that, you know, they, they fear someone like Kerry, who's so much been a part of the system since, you know, he used to be a Vietnam War protester and all that when he was a. But I think they're just, they're afraid that if they challenge this, I think Gore had some of the same fears. That, that democracy, as we know it, people are going to perceive it doesn't exist anymore, and then what are we going to do? What kind of society are we living in? You know, are we, are we living in some, uh, you know, quote, possibly fascist uh, uh, state where people are, you know, can, can do these kind of things and manipulate it? I think they're just so locked into that mindset, that would be my guess anyway, that and they can't... And we're supposed to go to polls and clamor there and support these people? Well, they don't have the passion even to defend their own victory. What, how are they going to stand up for the 99%? I don't That's know. a good question. Yeah. Well, I mean, when do you guys talk about Spoonamore? Because he gave a very incisive interview for an hour, and then Connell's plane crashed three yeah. weeks later. And I've seen subsequent interviews with him at trade shows. He won't go there. Spoonamore and I think, won't go there? Uh, uh, Spoonamore well, let, has never talk, talked about it again. Yeah. So is. maybe he got the message. Stephen Spoonamore is a Republican. Uh, computer expert who made millions of dollars uh, from a company he started that investigates computer fraud you know, for banks and governments and so on. Extremely conservative, ex-military. And he's the guy who persuaded Connell yeah. to, uh, to, to talk, to go public. Uh, and he had indeed been giving terrific interviews to the press, which would never quote them or publish them or run with them. You can go online and find an amazing interview he gave a few years ago about the Diebold machines. It was to ABC News. And the interviews are up there, but, but ABC News never ran them. Uh, uh, Robert is saying that, that after Connell uh, died, he, he, he gave stopped. A, he was, he's a computer expert. That, and I'm no expert, but he is in charge of, of those ATM machines when we stuck our credit cards in. Yeah. So he understood the man in the middle, the strategy that you guys were explaining, in spades, because there's a percentage of, of stealing whenever we try to buy something that even he can't get at, and that's his company. He deals with the chases and the city banks. So he, he, it, to him, it was, it was clear, once he saw the evidence, how it happened. So I read, I read and, and, and saw a video where he was incredibly coherent, but that plane crash was, was two or three weeks after that interview. It was an hour. In 2008, I, I, and, and, well, I, I and then he hasn't talked about it since. And I no, wonder. He did. About he that. did talk about did it he? since. I interviewed him did he? Uh, for for the one of the books I did with Jesse Ventura. And uh, on video? No, I interviewed him over, over the phone. Uh -huh. So I didn't interview him in person. But he was very forthright about it, including his theory of how Connell's plane went down and what you could do. And and uh, he is he Spoonamore is the guy who he decided he'd always been behind the scenes, and he decided in 2008, he went to the legal team in Ohio that was fighting this to find out what it, reveal what had really happened in 2004. And he offered himself as an expert witness. And he also got to know Connell. And he went to him, and this is, I'll give you one quote because uh, this is what Bruno Moore told me a couple of years ago. He said, I basically said, Mike, there's a lot of people you work with. And frankly, some of them I've worked with as well, and with some I still do, who treat democracy as a game where if their side wins, it doesn't matter if you cheat. Now, Mike, I don't think you're in that camp, but I do think you've worked very closely with some of the people who are. I intend to spend some of my time and resources and reputation on making their lives uncomfortable, and I'm giving you a heads up about it. Well, Mike didn't react the way I expected, Spoonamore told me. He reacted by taking my hands and asking to pray, and he said, I don't think you know how far over your head you're going to get. It's Chinatown. <laughs> and and let me add to just just before we go there, because um, you're on the right track. I mean, it, it's 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 <laughs> if you wanted to liven up a party, you know, of, of morose election integrity activists, ask the question, why aren't the Democrats all over this? And you'll get five different answers and five part harmony. You know, uh, everything from you know ignorance uh, to uh, complicity 
to uh, denial, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's, it's really important to recognize that, you know, there are people with, with cancer who will not go to the doctor even, you know, after it's pretty obvious that they have something dreadful going on. Um, they'd rather die <laughs> than find out that they have cancer. And I think that the action imperative creates a paralysis in this department because once you know, and, and more significantly, once you acknowledge you know that this is a reality, it becomes imperative to do something. And it's hard to know what to do because this is really, you know, it's not a question of correcting a few glitches here or fixing an election there, you know. It, this is like, <laughs> This is for all the marbles. This is the difference between a sham democracy and a real democracy. Um, this really, it, it's everything in the basket. And the forces are very, very, very powerful. And so you get a real strong version of bystander syndrome um, where, you know, you just hope that somebody else will do something about it. And Mark and I, you know, and I'm sure Dick and Josh, we could, you know, I, I have, I should get them to sign it, but you know, dozens of good luck with your work <laughs> messages. I appreciate what you're doing, good luck with your work. I don't have the bandwidth to get into it myself. From people who should know better, I'll name names. David Callahan, The Cheating Culture. Thomas Mann, What's Wrong With The, uh, you know, It's Even Worse Than You Think. These are the real villains. I'm sorry, they are the villains. Karl Rove is doing what Karl Rove was programmed in some other life to do. He's Sauron for the Lord of the Rings people here. He can't help being the, 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 the Dark Lord. But Saruman is a different story. Somebody who is a wizard, somebody who has knowledge, somebody who has the potential to do good and get seduced. And even if that seduction is only the, the fear of being marginalized, of losing your seat at the table with the big boys. I'm sorry, people. That isn't good enough. Those people are on my shit list. And they will be until they step up and do something. No, the hobbits have to do something. I'm, I'm sorry? The hobbits. The hobbits, yeah. Well, it could be. I mean, I, you're closer than you think. And I, and I will say that, that Vicki Collier, who could not be here tonight because she's in Mexico, um, is, is, is um, an author of an article about to come out uh, in the November issue of Harper's, which will be in, on the newsstand soon and online. Uh, that's a 7,000 word article that was not entirely butchered by the Harper's editors. So there's, there's, still, there's still some meat there, it's, it's pretty good. And she once said to me, because we had some exchanges back and forth about how we felt, we do commiserate with one another because it's a little lonely. Um, not being believed, the Cassandra story, I mean, it's, it's not pleasant. And I once, you know, I compared her to Eowyn or somebody in the, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, and she said, no, if there's anybody I feel like, you know, because Eowyn sort of just puts down her shield, gets married, you know, blah, blah, blah. If it's anybody I feel like, it's Frodo on the way to Mortar, and already so wounded that he pretty much knows he's never going to recover and still has this task to do and you know with the help of sam um doesn't quite he doesn't quite make it <laughs> you know he needs Gollum to bite off his finger with the ring but i mean he makes it all the way to mount doom and she said i feel that lonely i feel that tired and i feel that friendless and so you're not far off with the hobbits that's i <laughs> A lot of the time, that's how we feel. I was so, um, what's the word I want to use? Traumatized <laughs> by the experience I had, you know, writing about this, that, that I, I decided to look into the question. And I think it's a very, very apposite question. Where this conspiracy theory trope came from, because that's really what we're talking about here. And it isn't only this issue. I mean, there are all kinds of issues that are undiscussable. You cannot bring them up because if you even ask questions about them, you're guilty of conspiracy theory, and we've come to the, such a pass that that's a career killer. I mean, if you're a journalist, left or center, and you're doing conspiracy theory, you might as well go jump off a cliff. 
I mean, that's the end. You're finished. And that's not unrelated to why so many Democrats won't go there, because that's that's it. You're you're, you're finished. I was interested to know how did that happen? Where, where did that come from? Was conspiracy theory always on everybody's lips? Did people always say, well, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, and then they'll make some perfectly rational observation, right? People do that all the time. Well, it just so happens that you can date the beginning of the use of that expression to the late 60s. In other words, if you go back and you look at the archives of the New York Times, Time Magazine and Washington Post, the Washington Post, and do a search on that phrase, you find that it was rarely used until the late 60s by any of them. And when it was used, it was not used in any consistent way. You know, they'd refer to various kinds of things as conspiracy theory. After the late 60s, it's used often, and it's always used to marginalize uh, some leftist idea about the powers that be. See? And in, in fact, it, it, it starts to be used in 1967 age in reviews of books questioning the results of the Warren Commission. Okay? And indeed, we find that there is a memo that the CIA sent out to the state station <coughs> chiefs worldwide, January 4th, 1967, it's online, talking about the problem of these books raising questions about the Warren Commission report. One was uh, uh, Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, and the other was Inquest by Edward J. Epstein. And, you know, Epstein's book had it that Castro killed Kennedy. I mean, there was nothing left about the books necessarily. They were simply questioning the results, you know, the conclusions of the Warren Commission. And the memo is very explicit. It says, we have to do something about these reviews, which are questioning the work of a very responsible body. I mean, there's no cynicism in it. They, they, their official position is, this is a solid report and it's problematic that it's being questioned. So what we have to do is use our propaganda assets and friends in the media, that's a quote, to uh, marginalize the work of these conspiracy theorists by making the following five arguments. Some of these arguments are the same ones that Jonathan and, and Josh and I and others have heard repeatedly. Well, if there were a conspiracy like this, someone would have talked by now. You know, all these arguments you hear time and time again. It's in the memo, right? Now it is, it's, it's everywhere. You ask questions about 9-11, you know, you ask questions, you talk about the CIA's drug dealing in the inner city, you talk about Iran-Contra, you wander off the reservation in any way. And I'm not saying, I mean, that all these theories hold water, I'm just saying you can't even discuss the subjects without being charged with conspiracy theory, and it starts at that moment, and it's still with us now. And I would just say one last thing, it is the most exquisite means of denying free speech that I can think of. Far more effective than what they do in places like Russia, which is shoot errant journalists in the head. You don't need to do that when you've got this kind of verbal cudgel. Because as soon as somebody's charged of being conspiracy theorists, they're, they're finished, as, as happened to Gary Webb. Who wrote his book on the CIA drug dealing in the city? Gary Webb was shot in the head. <laughs> yeah, eventually. Yeah, well, he shot himself. Yeah, go ahead. He I shot himself know. twice in the head. I buy 100%. Everything that you said about this manipulation, okay, that's a given for me. Everybody who runs for office, <coughs> Kerry, your friend, the 116 people that lost their seats. Al Gore, they are running for office for a, a number of reasons. Ego, power, maybe even some part of wanting to do good. They've invested time, they've invested money, they lost. Even if there is a wisp of the election being stolen from them, would you just talk a little bit more about why Kerry said nothing, why your friend said nothing? Are there no Democratic techno-nerds who are on this case? Is, it, is the playing field just given over to them? I want to win. I don't like to lose if I'm running for office. I've lost. You tell me as my friend. You know, <coughs> this was stolen from you. I say, okay. I say, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's it's mind boggling. But yes. what do you think? I mean, give me frankly, it doesn't surprise me at all. Well, because yeah. of the, what we talked about earlier. Yeah. Look at your, I used to think whistleblower was a positive word. If you're a whistleblower, you'll lose your job. If you say these things, you can't make your mortgage. And it's clear that, that you guys, I mean, I've interviewed you, I know how bright you are. It, it, the, the problem here is that you lose your job, you lose your career. You, you can speak to 100 very interested people, but you don't, will not have a platform. You simply won't have that platform. The key word here is how do you intervene? That is the word that has to be in front of everyone's mind. Ironically, I've just done a picture for the last six years on aging science. I've been hanging out with the people at Cambridge and MIT and every, all around the world. You happen to be doing that. The word and the stem cell people, how do we intervene? What's the game? What is the point of intervention? The point of intervention probably here is to keep the presidency for 12 more years and reset the judiciary. Why is this software a trade secret. Please tell me, would anyone here ever use their bank card if, if we could look and someone wasn't overseeing the bank cards? Who the hell would ever use a credit card anywhere unless, it, you know, they have two people? Spoonmore explained this. You know, they don't know each other, looking at every line. How could it be that whether or not this guy gets the vote or that guy has to be a trade secret? What, what? That is a legal decision so my intervening point here is keep the presidency, you keep the Supreme Court, well, you, you keep the, the judiciary. I want to hear about John Kerry. I don't want to hear about it. Tell me about I think John Kerry. Just, I have mean, to intervene. His wife has more money than God. He's an elected official. He's got nothing to lose. He can blow as many whistles as he wants. He's not going to lose his career. He could be in on it. in on his losing? He could be in on it. And he never would have been if he said anything about this. I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more meat um, to the argument about uh, just why this is all happening. I mean, the fact that external servers exist is not evidence of itself. It's something that was going to happen. The fact that you know we got swept in 2010 was everyone thought that was going to happen, so that isn't evidence yeah. of anything. I mean, just a little more detail. Okay. Talking. About the statistics? How is, how is, no, just sort of like your tactics. What is the evidence? Know. What is the meat of this argument? Because I think conceptually we all agree, but you only had a very short amount of time to. Yeah, I mean that, and that's why I kind of skipped over that and just sort of hope that <laughs> you take it on faith. But um, I, I guess that's a it's sin. Issue yes, it's, it's absolutely a sin. Um, and that's because you know when you go into that. Uh, let me try. I'll, I'll give it my best shot. I mean, we we. Yeah, let me let me give you let me give you one really simple example. When the exit polls came out in 2004, they said. Well, more Democrats than Republicans respond to the exit polls. How do we answer that? Well, Edison Matofsky released some of their data uh, two months later, and we looked. If, it's, if that's the problem, then you expect that in the Republican districts, you'd have a lower, lower overall response rate to the exit polls. Right? If, re if Republicans are less likely to take the exit poll, then you look at the Republican districts and the Democratic districts, the Republican districts would have less response rate overall. And in fact, we found the opposite, that the response rate in Republican districts was higher. You'd also expect less fraud. Ohio Secretary of State J. Kenneth Blackwell hired Connell to create a computer data compilation. So he wrote the software that brings in the votes from the different counties uh, in preparation for the 2004 election. He created the system operating on a computer in the official site in uh, Columbus, Ohio. He had another copy of that same software in his office in Chattanooga, in uh, the office of his company called Smart Tech Solutions. So then came the election. It was a cold, wet day. There were many people disenfranchised by hours long lines, sometimes up to 10 hours long. Low-income voters, black voters were turned away from the polls selectively. They had been purged. And do you remember the, um, the card weight issue at that year? People mailed in these registration cards, and it was, there were hundreds of thousands of these that were on the wrong weight paper, and they were threatening to throw those out. Uh, there, was also a, there were also purges, um, and 
There were confusing ballots, as in Florida a few years earlier. So the confusing ballots made people uh, tempted to vote for third-party candidates in Cleveland. So all of that, I guess they figured that that was enough to swing the vote, but it wasn't. Comes midnight, and Kerry is still has a handy lead of a hundred and something thousand votes over Bush. Well, at twelve twenty on the night of elections in two thousand four, the election polls, the exit polls, and the initial vote counts showed Kerry the clear winner, and the twenty the twenty votes of Ohio at that point were all that were needed. That all the other states had reported in, so those votes of Ohio were clearly going to uh, swing the entire country one way or the other. But at 1220, the computer that reports the votes to the press went down. It went black. Then the computer came back up online at 2 in the morning. But the computer that came up at 2 in the morning was not the same computer that went down at 1220. How do we know this? This was actually discovered two years later by a computer hacker looking at the lists of what IP address um, co corresponds to what um, URL. I mean, it's, a, it's a technical thing, but there's got to be a map that when you type in uh, sos.ohio.gov, it tells it where that computer is and where to go to. And there are legitimate reasons for the same site being switched to different computers. So there's got to be a map someplace. Someone looked at the history of that map and realized that just for 12 hours on the morning after election day, that, con that site, secretaryofstate.ohio.gov, was switched from Columbus, Ohio, to this basement in Chattanooga, just Chattanooga, Tennessee, the operation run by Mike Connell. So after that swap, the computer came back up, and there's this miraculous 240,000 vote switch. This is seven hours after the polls closed. 240,000 votes had switched from Bush to, uh, from uh, Kerry to Bush. And that's the way it stayed for the rest of the morning, and they just reported, well, it looks like Bush won, <laughs> Bush won the election. Uh, there were that, that was not even known for, for two years afterward. Um, the, the part about uh, another, another piece of it that was not known until 2008 was that part of the specifications for the software that Mike Connell was writing was a direct link to the White House so that the White House had access to those numbers as they were being reported in real time. They could read those numbers and they could write those numbers in real time. So now we know how the election was stolen in 2004. And there was a team of lawyers pursuing a lawsuit, gradually uh, working their way through the court system. It came to 2008 before they had Mike, Cos Mike Connell listed for a deposition. And actually, November 2008, Mike Connell appeared at a deposition and the lawyer wouldn't let him answer a single question. He essentially stonewalled that time. The, the, in depositions, you don't have to have the judge there. It's just the lawyers on both sides. And if there's a question, do you really have to answer this question or not? Um, there's an objection, and the objections are taken to the judge later. So all these objections were taken afterward to the judge, and the judge says, yeah, well, yeah he does have to answer those questions. So they reschedule another deposition with Mike Connell. The deposition was rescheduled for January. Meanwhile, there are various threats to Connell's life coming through. And the lawyer in this, in this um, lawsuit wrote to the Attorney General of the uh, country saying that we have confidentially informed, we've been confidentially informed by a source we believe credible that Carl Rove has threatened Mike Connell a principal witness that we've identified in our King Lincoln case in federal court in Columbus, Ohio. In the previous two months, Connell had canceled two trips on his plane because there were suspicious problems with the mechanics of the airplane. 
So just to, to finish this uh, story, Connell, Connell died on December 19th. He never was deposed. And uh, we know what happened, but we don't, have, we don't have the proof, we don't have the lawsuit. And I don't imagine any of you have read this in the New York Times, that, uh, that all this had happened, that there was a suspicious death. The, the, the death was reported as uh, an airplane accident. Some people said the airplane ran out of fuel, which is completely, complete nonsense. Uh, as, as far as I know, there was no reporting, even in the back pages of the mainstream media, about the, either about the revelation that the computer that counted the votes was actually in Chattanooga or about Connell's death. Uh, so just to finish, that's the best story we have. We have a handful of other anecdotes. We have lots of statistics. And these days, we have less stories and more statistics. We rely more on statistics to know how the, the vote count is being manipulated. From what we can tell, the manipulation, the computer manipulation of the vote has become entrenched. It's always in one direction. It's always favoring Republicans. And it's become systematized and centralized over the last few years, larger with each passing election from 2004 to 6 to 8 to 10. The, the, um, the gaps between what we expect and what we see in the returns get larger and larger. Um, that's where we are. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just jump in really quickly. <clears throat> the contract that Connell signed with the office of the Secretary of State in Ohio is, is available. I mean, you can go to my blog, Jerusalem Underground, and scroll down on the right, you can click on a link to it. It's there. The whole contract. This is beyond dispute. We set up a so-called mirror site with a computer in a basement in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that essentially enabled them to steal the election. This is a fact. Also, just as, uh, for a little bit of uh, dramatic color, in the middle of this deposition, which is the day before Election Day, 2008, they took a bathroom break, and Connell followed the two lawyers into the men's room to talk to them, without his lawyer there. And being honest men, Bob Petrakis and Cliff Arnabeck, refused to talk to him. This is an ex parte communication, we can't talk to you. Right? Six weeks later, they were sorry they had been such sticklers, because he had a lot to say, and, and it seems likely that he perished for that reason. And I'm sorry to jump in. Jonathan, Thanks. take it away. OK, sometimes uh, I guess I'm accused of being overly cynical. And uh, just to get that out of the way and to let you know how cynical I am, um, I wrote in the first week of December when it came out that Mike Connell was scheduled to have a, essentially a redo of the deposition under oath. I said, and I wrote it, it's out there, this guy will never see Christmas. And, um, you know, when you're right enough, about things that you'd never think you'd be right about, you start making notes, mental notes. Um, we found out in the advance of Carl Ro of the 2010 election, which as you know was this massive Republican sweep of basically every House seat that was up for grabs that wasn't gerrymandered. We found out in advance, and I wrote in advance, Carl Rove is going to leave California alone. Not a single seat changed hands in California. So, you know, when we're asked to prove what's going on, we have, we have ways of finding things out that don't amount to proof. And the reason for that is that the, the smoking gun that we're asked to produce prove that this election system is not on the level, as opposed to having the election system prove that it is on the level, the burden of proof is on us, produce the smoking gun. Well, smoking gun would be things like tainted memory cards, actual ballots, and op scan machines when they drop through after they've been uh, supposedly scanned by the op scan, code that goes into these machines, into the touch screen machines or the op scans. All of that, all of it, 100% of that is off limits to public investigation. Nothing 
is available that could be considered a smoking gun. So we, um, sort of the bake sale forensics experts here on a, on a budget of essentially zero, go around and, you know, with sort of a broom and a dustpan after these elections, trying to figure out what the heck has gone on. And we use, uh, you know, tactics and, and, and protocols ranging from the obvious to the clever. And the details, I think, you know, you'd best to go to things like Loser Take All, um, Mark's book, or the electiondefensealliance.org website um, for the mind-numbing details. But what's salient about it is that it all points in the same direction. I mean, we're not talking about a single election here. Um, we're not talking about only the presidency. We're talking about election after election after election since these machines went in in 2002. All what we call redshifted, which means that the vote counts are to the right of every baseline we can find. Exit polls, pre-election polls, hand counts, um, some baselines that we are able to cook up using a little bit of ingenuity that would take too long to explain. But everything, everything, over and over and over again. And so when we ask, like, why the heck? And this, the New York Times is willing to ask, and, you know, and, and various, the Nation magazine and stuff. Why do we have this weird politics? New York Review of Books, headline, uh, front page, are weird politics now? Why are politics so weird? And they ask, oh, I don't know, you know, four writers to review four really good books. And everybody comes up with everything, money, you know,